Good afternoon, section Zoom. Dean Beck here from the Almost Empty Law School. Uh, probably the only person in the building that I'm aware of anyway is Dean Rutledge right next door. So if you hear any voice on a telephone in the background, that's probably the Dean talking to somebody. Um, it is time for us to continue in chapter eight of the Duke Muneer book. And we are in the section of the book that is called Chain of Title Problems. And so the first case that we're going to look at is a Minnesota case from early in the 20th century, Board of Education of Minneapolis versus Hughes. Um, so I've got the kind of series of transactions that are important on a whiteboard behind me. Um, but let me kind of walk you through what happens in the case, right? Um, so Carrie Horger is the original owner of a lot. Um, and in May of 1906, she executes a deed to that lot and she signs her name on it as the grantor, but the grantee line is blank, doesn't have anybody's name as the grantee. She gets $25 for that deed of the lot. Um, a few years later, in April of 2009, Horger executes another deed, and this one is to a firm called Duria and Wilson, and it is a quit claim deed. Remember that we said quit claim deeds were deeds without warranties. It's where the person says, well, I'll sell you whatever interest I have in a piece of property, but I don't promise, I don't warrant that I actually have any interest. So maybe the reason Horger uh, uses a quit claim deed is because she has already sold the property to somebody else. But in any event, she uh, gives a quit claim deed to Dree and Wilson and gets $25 from them as well. Now, Dree and Wilson, when they purchased or purported to purchase the lot from Horger, uh, did they have any notice of the earlier transaction where Horger had signed a blank deed to the property? Uh, well, they certainly uh, didn't have any record notice because that deed had not been recorded at that point. Um, it is possible they had actual notice, but there's nothing in the case that indicates that that's, that that's true. So we're assuming, I guess, at that point that uh, Dury and Wilson probably had no notice of the prior transaction. Um, at that point, though, they do not record the deed that they get from Horker. Now, uh, they turn around in November of 1909, and they sell uh, the lot to the Board of Education. So the deed from Horger to the Dury and Wilson was deed one, and the deed from Dury and Wilson to the Board of Education, that's deed two. That deed also is not recorded immediately at that time. Um, later on, the Board of Education gets around to recording their deed. So January of the next year, a couple months after the transaction, they rec record the deed that they got from Daria and Wilson. Um, then in December of 2010, uh, about, I guess, 11 months after recording of the deed to the Board of Education, uh, at that point, Hughes fills his name in on the blank, on the blank deed, um, and then he he records the deed uh, December 16th of 2010. So that deed has now been recorded. And then about five days later, um, somebody kind of figures out that uh, there's a problem. And so the original deed from Horger to Dree and Wilson is recorded on December 21st of 2010. Uh, we're in Minnesota, which has a race notice statute. Um, and so uh, Hughes argues that he is entitled to prevail over the Board of Education uh, by virtue of the recording statute. He says that he is a subsequent bona fide purchaser for value without notice of the earlier instru instrument. Um, and since this is a race notice jurisdiction that he recorded first and therefore should prevail. Now, this kind of raises a puzzle for us because um, Hughes, it seems to us, actually got his deed much earlier than the Board of Education. How is it that he can be claiming to be a subsequent purchaser? And that has to do with the court's view of the effective date of the deed from Horger. Basically, the court thinks that 
the deed was not effective when it was first handed to Hughes or sent to Hughes with no name in as grantee. It only became effective down here in December of 2010 when Hughes filled his own name into the deed as the grantee. Uh, and so the court treats him as having been a grantee as of December of 2010. Um, and so uh, if we assume that that is when Hughes is treated as the purchaser of the lot from Porter, um, does he win under the uh, recording statute? And the court decides, yes, he does win under the recording statute, that he was a subsequent purchaser for value, uh, that he did not have notice of the Board of Education's claim. Um, well, the Board of Education says, wait a minute, we actually did record our deed 11 months before Hughes signed his name on the deed, right? And so um, there is a record in the record recording system showing that we have an interest in this property that predates the interest of Hughes if we treat him as a December 1910 purchaser. Um, the problem with that, according to the court, is that there was no complete chain of title that would connect the Board of Education's deed that was on record to Horger, the original owner. So it's what is sometimes called a wild deed. It's in the recording system, but a title searcher who is looking to see transactions uh, originating with Horger has no way to locate that deed because there's no chain of title from Horger to the Board of Education in the records at that point. It's a deed from somebody who is an apparent stranger to the title, the, uh, the court suggests. Um, so the questions that the authors ask after the case, let me share those with you. Over here on uh, page 443, question one. Um, they notice that they note that Minnesota had a race notice statute. And they ask, would the result in the case be different in a jurisdiction that had a notice statute? Um, and the answer is that it would actually come out the same way if we continue to treat Hughes as a purchaser of the property in 2010, as the court does in this case, it's actually easier for Hughes to establish uh, priority under the recording statute if it's a notice statute, because he, not, he just has to take uh, for value without notice, doesn't even have to record first, and so uh, the, the uh, steps you need to take to establish priority are easier in a notice jurisdiction. Um, then the authors ask, would the result in Hughes be different if a tract index were used. So here we've been assuming that uh, we're using grantor grantee indexes, which are kind of common uh, forms of index used in many jurisdictions. Um, but some jurisdictions have a tract index that will allow you to kind of look at a piece of land by parcel number or some other identification. And all of the documents relating to that piece of land will be recorded together under that tract rather than under the names of grantors and grantees. And so would that make any difference? Well, if that were the case, then a title searcher who was searching for documents affecting this lot would have found the deed from Doria and Wilson to the Board of Education. Um, of course, that doesn't necessarily prove to the title searcher that the Doria and Wilson had any interest in the property that they could convey to the Board of Education, but that probably would be enough uh, or at least might be enough to put uh, the title searcher on what courts sometimes call inquiry notice. In other words, at that point, the title searcher can't just say, well, I don't know where Dury and Wilson thinks they got an interest in the property. Uh, the title searcher might have to start asking additional questions to try and find out why did Dury and Wilson uh, purport to transfer to this lot? And if they had asked those questions, then they would have found out or might have point found out about the deed to Dury and Wilson from Horger. Um, then in question two down here, uh, the authors ask, what are the rights of the Board of Education against Drea and Wilson and against Kerry Horker? So let's think first of all about Drea and Wilson. Um, notice that the deed that Drea and Wilson gave uh, to the Board of Education is described as a warranty deed. 
They're not specific. They don't say whether it's a special warranty deed or a general warranty deed. But assuming it was a general warranty deed, then the Board of Education should have a breach of warranty claim against Drian Wilson because uh, Drian Wilson purported to tr uh, transfer title to a lot that they did not own and did not have the right to convey. Um, would the Board of Education potentially have a claim against Horger? Here, the authors think that perhaps they would have an unjust enrichment claim, um, that she was paid twice for the same lot, $25 from Hughes and then $25 from Drew and Wilson. Um, and so perhaps they could argue that she's been unjustly enriched and the $25 should be refunded to prevent that. Um, now, over here on the next page, question three, um, they note this peculiarity about the court treating this as a deed that was uh, delivered to the grantee in 1910, when in fact it was handed over with no grantee's name filled in in 1906. So what if we decided that actually Hughes uh, was, was the grantee in fact in May of 1906 rather than in December of, two, of 1910, um, how, who would win? Um, the authors think that under a notice statute, the Board of Education would win because it purchased without any notice of the 1906 transaction by which Horger transferred to Hughes. Um, now, under a race notice statute, would the Board of Education win? Well, they have to establish everything they would in, under a notice statute, that they paid value and took without notice, and they've done that. But they also have to record first. And so there's an ambiguity here about whether the Board of Education could win under a, record, a, record, uh, a, a race notice statute uh, because there is a, an ambiguity as to whether they have actually recorded their deed. They have put the deed from Drie and Wilson to the Board of Education in the recording system, but they don't have a complete chain of title, including the earlier deed from Horger to Drie and Wilson. And so you could have a, an argument over whether their deed was actually recorded in the way that is required to, to show that they have recorded first under the race notice recording statute. All right. All right, the next case that we're going to look at is Gwilett versus Daily Drywall. That case is over here on page 444. Um, the defendant in this case is Daily Drywall, and they have bought a lot in a subdivision. Um, let me show you a, a kind of a schematic of what might be going on here, right? So we've got this subdivision. We don't know how many lots, or at least I'm not certain how many lots, but um, the original owner of the subdivision is Gilmore. So Gilmore owned all of this land and then carved it into individual lots that are going to be sold to different people. And so we have daily drywall um, who uh, have a lot in the subdivision. I'm just for, uh, I'm imagining that it's like this corner lot, lot P. Um, and they want to build an apartment building on that lot. Now the plaintiffs are other people who own lots in the subdivision, including uh, a family called the Gwilettes. And I'm just assuming here that they own lot D, but it's one of the other lots in the subdivision. Um, and their theory is that there is a restrictive covenant that bars daily from building an apartment building, that the restrictive covenant says that these lots can only be used to, per, to build single family dwellings. Um, and so the question then is, is daily bound by that restrictive covenant in a way that would prevent daily from building an apartment building? Um, so where do we find this restrictive covenant? Well, if we look at the deed that Gilmore transferred to Daly and read every word of it, you're not going to find the restrictive covenant anywhere in that deed. Um, there is a reference in that deed to a common plan for the subdivision. So if you read the deed, you might get the idea that, oh, there's some kind of set of rules that applies to all of these lots. But if you look at that common plan, 
there's you're going to be no reference to this restriction saying that the lots can only be used for single family dwellings. Um, and so that doesn't help. Um, and so where is the restriction found? Well, it turns out that this restriction is found in an earlier deed that Gilmore transferred to the Gwilettes for what we're calling lot D, just hypothetically. Um, so that raises a question, and Daly says, you know, this restriction is not uh, applicable to us. It is in a deed for lot D. We own lot P, and so we should not be subject to that restrictive covenant. Um, so why does the Gwilett family think that it applies to Daly? Well, let's take a look in the book. Over at note six on page 445. And if you read the deed to the Gwilettes, it talks about some restrictions that are imposed for the benefit of the other lots shown on the said plan. Um, and it also says that uh, the same restrictions are hereby imposed on each of said lots now owned by the seller in this case, Gilmore. So Gilmore gave the Gwilettes a deed to lot D in the subdivision. At that time, Gilmore still owned lot P, the one that Daly now has purchased. And Gilmore in that deed to the Gwilettes promised that these restrictions that were put on Gwilettes lot also applied to all of the other lots that were owned by Gilmore, including lot P. Now, Daly says we should not be bound by that restriction because we had no notice of it. We did not know that in some deed to some other random neighbor in the subdivision, there was some restriction on the lot that we were purchasing. We should only have to look at deeds in our chain of title for our specific lot. Um, the, major the, the court, though, says no, actually in this case, if you are doing a title search of uh, one of the lots in the subdivision, you should be looking at all of the deeds in that subdivision that Gilmore, the grantor, uh, executed because who knows whether one of the other deeds, the lots A, B, C, D, E, E, F, G, whatever, might have some restriction that applies to lot P. And so the title searcher has to kind of look at all of those transfers that Gilmore made before the transfer to Daly. Um, now, obviously, if that's the rule, that makes title searching a lot more uh, difficult, makes it more expensive, and so the uh, question is, you know, do other jurisdictions agree with that? Um, in note one after the case, the Stobuck and Whitman treatise says, well, the cases are equally divided between this position and the position that uh, you only have to worry about a restrictive covenant in uh, the chain of title for your particular lot. Um, now, on page 446, let me share the screen again. On page 446, note two, or note one, I'm sorry, here's the question. Um, If you were practicing in Illinois, New York, or Ohio, cases there's states that don't follow the rule in this case, how would you put the subdivider's covenants in the deeds so as to give notice to all subsequent purchasers? So um, you are advising Gilmore, and Gilmore wants to create a subdivision and wants to make sure that every lot in the subdivision is subject to the same restrictions. Um, and is kind of worried that the attorney's kind of forgetful and might not remember to put them in every individual deed to an individual purchaser. And so is there a way that you can kind of set up the subdivision at the outset to make sure that the restrictions that you want uh, apply to every lot within the subdivision, right? Um, and so here is a way that you can do that, right? You can have um, Gilmore, who is the owner of all of the lots, um, transfer 
all of the lots to a straw person. So somebody like the secretary in the lawyer's office or something like that. Um, and then the straw person has title to all of these lots in the subdivision. Um, and the straw person conveys uh, one lot to a purchaser um, and imposes restrictions um, on both the purchaser's lot and on the remaining lots held by the straw person. And then it can transfer all the remaining lots back to Gilmore um, and all of the lots that Gilmore subsequently sells in that subdivision in their chain of title back to the straw person will have the restrictions applying to that particular lot, not to some other random lot in the subdivision. Um, so question two that the authors ask over on page 446, would the problem in example eight arise if the jurisdiction had a tract index? Um, and the authors think that it would still arise. You still would have the same problem because you have to decide, all right, which lots in the tract index do you have to look at? Do you look at only the particular lot in the tract index that is purchased by daily? Or do you look at lots purchased by other people that happen to be in the same subdivision? 